crime, closures, a spring break breakdown. City of Miami Beach has declared a state of emergency. It's just sad that it had to be like this. We came here to enjoy ourselves. And the backlash, black visitors crying foul. They're met with heavy police presence. They're met with street closure. We're not targeting a, a group of people, we're targeting conduct. Peaceful protest versus public disorder. This is a fascist bill! The bill cracking down on rioters passes in the Florida House. You have no right to riot. It's not in the First Amendment. But faces roadblocks in the state Senate. The big stories of the week and the leaders on the front lines all live this week in South Florida. Good morning. Welcome. Glad you could join us. I'm Michael Putnam. I'm Glenna Milberg. Great to be with you. Back to the beach. We begin today with the partying, the police response, and the perception that race plays a role. From the very first days of spring break, the South Beach Entertainment District has at times looked like a wild party zone inside a police state. That law enforcement effort has at times been heavy handed. Also, though, effective, more than a thousand arrests and more than a hundred guns have been seized. Damages closed many businesses and restaurants and others were forced to close because of that 8 p.m. curfew. But the perception that the heavy handed response is race related. That is our focus this week. Miami Beach's mayor and police chief categorically deny that our guests today believe otherwise. Stephen Johnson is the chair of the Miami-Dade County's Black Advisory Board that was first established in 1979. And Glendon Hall is the chair of Miami Beach's newly formed Black Affairs Advisory Committee. That's just about a month old. So great to have you both aboard. Good morning, Good gentlemen. Morning. Glad, glad you are here. Stephen Johnson, we know you well. You've been a guest here uh, on the round table on This Week in South Florida. We're glad to see you and glad to meet Glendon Hall. Stephen, over the last couple of weeks, you've been very critical of Miami Beach Police. You've said that they were too aggressive in the way they responded to the young people who were acting out, mainly predominantly black people. You said that it was, quote, a total overreaction by police. Why do you think so? So if you look, uh, Michael, at what was happening, uh, Miami Beach Police Department is well-trained at managing crowds and events. They've done it for years. And for over 20 years, we've had Memorial Day weekend in, in South Beach, and we've had uh, spring break attended by black people in South Beach. However, this is the first year that, uh, in addition to instituting a curfew, they enforce that curfew by spraying pepper balls at people who literally had no idea about the curfew. They did not wait to allow the goodwill ambassadors and people like Lyndon who were there trying to, to clear the streets. They didn't wait. They overreacted to their job at the time. And while I disagree with instituting the curfew, that's the city of Miami Beach's right. Yes, but Stephen, Stephen, if I can, excuse me, let me just interrupt here. A little follow-up question here. I'll grant you, kids who are on spring break aren't watching the news. They are not reading newspapers. They're not necessarily reading on their phones uh, what's going on, and they didn't know about the curfew. But the police were going down Washington and Collins, you know, Ocean Drive with loudspeakers saying there is a curfew in effect, 8 p.m., you've got to leave this area. And hundreds of them initially just refused to leave. The police say that that's why they fired the pepper balls. I don't know that that's accurate. And more importantly, you announced the curfew at 4 p.m. to take effect at 8 p.m. And at 9.30, you start shooting pepper spray into the crowd as though you're dispersing uh, protesters. That's not appropriate. The people who were there were not necessarily the people that you were angry at for, for destroying property or for committing crimes. Those people, many of them, over half of them, were legitimately tourists who were there to enjoy their vacation. That's not hospitality and that's not how you treat your tourists, Michael. Okay, let me, um, there's a lot to unpack with what you just said and what you, Stephen, are talking about is overreaction, duly noted. I think in the bigger picture, there's a, there's a much larger issue with 
not only reaction after the fact, but preparation before the fact, which was also very law enforcement intensive. But I want to bring Glendon Hall into the conversation. Uh, beach businessman, beach resident, newly chair of this new advisory board. Glendon, first of all, great to meet you via <laughs> Skype. And second of all, this issue that Miami Beach has been facing, and let me just put on the record, this is a great conversation that everyone should be having of every ethnicity because we don't talk about this enough. Uh, I want to hear from you, why now? Why is there a black advisory board now, which is a great thing, but why not last year or five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago when the first mm -hmm. Memorial Day big uh, urban beach week, I think they used to call mm -hmm. it, first happened? Well, I think I, I give um, Mayor Gelber credit for this. Uh, he is a neighbor of mine and I think he's a good man. Um, he had the political will to actually put this together, institute this. And what we do, we provide a different perspective of you know what, what's going on. And so too, we, a lot of people don't even realize that there is a black community even on Miami Beach, which is kind of, um, you know, kind of sad. Okay, people... so the question though is, where's, why now? Is it because of what has happened this, these two weeks, three weeks, four weeks? Why? No, no. This this was set up before that even happened. Oh, okay. So so this is not in a reaction to that. It may have been an, a reaction to things past that uh, a perspective was needed on. I call it the three P's: policy, programming, and procurement. You know, that, to get the perspective from us of uh, maybe ways to do things differently with a different vantage point. All right. So Stephen, let me go back to where where you were just a moment ago. Last week, we had the mayor, we had the police chief on this program. We talked all about this. The mayor said um, almost verbatim, we are targeting behavior, not people. And the deputy police chief who was not on this program, Wayne Jones, who is a veteran black police officer on Miami Beach, said almost those same things. The intention is behavior. And if you look at the city manager's rundown of a month, which we have here in memo form, more than a thousand arrests, half of them from out of state, half of them, uh, a third of them from within the vicinity, uh, weapons and drugs and vandalism, there is no doubt behavior that police have been reacting to. So how do you, how do you in take race to be part of that? And, and maybe not a, a just age, maybe it's age and spring break kids being spring break kids and then a couple of them take advantage of the mob related scene. Break down how, how that is perceived. Happy to, Glenna, and thank you. So first of all, let's remember that uh, the discussion around spring break and how the police were policing spring break did not start just last week. It started last year. The very last event that I went to was a press conference held by the NAACP decrying the police tactics used last year before the COVID-related shutdowns. I note that uh, Mayor Gelber has said a lot. One of the things that has concerned me is he said, we should stop calling this spring break because these are not college kids. And as a formerly 25 year old spring breaker who was actually completing their last year of undergrad, I can tell the mayor, listen, I don't know what your experience is, but the black experience isn't necessarily 18 to 21 and finished college. So let's stop using the broad brush. My objection is the broad brush. My objection is also the, the paintball guns with pepper spray in them that have only come out when black people go to the beach. Yes. These are things I have a concern about and hopefully we'll be able to discuss it with the chief because if you properly prepare and program, you can actually have a successful event where you don't have crowds of people uh, milled up at 8th and Ocean. Yeah, the Stephen, Stephen, we, forgive me, we, we were just showing some video, you probably couldn't see it, you know, of some of the really wild excesses of the last couple of weeks on South Beach, people dancing on top of cars, not their own cars, other people's cars, people twerking, um, uh, you know, a stampeding crowds. I mean, really a chaotic scene. And predominantly the people in those pictures are black. And I guess the question, the question that I've got is police reacted 
they would have reacted if those were white kids who were doing it. Did they overreact because they were I, black? I can make a comment on that, please. Um, I was actually embedded with PD uh, multiple times um, during that week, and I was there Saturday night. So my Meets PD was doing a great job with the uh, help of uh, Officer Mitchell and some of the Google ambassadors that don't get highlighted. They were dispersing the crowd. They were calming things down, and all of a sudden, the SWAT truck showed up from Carl Gables, unannounced. Even the officer who was with me didn't even know it was coming. So while we were calming people down, the SWAT truck actually elevated everything. It increased tensions. So our issue is, you know, we have Ultra Music Fest that you have hundreds and hundreds of arrests, multiple fatalities. We even had a, a security guard almost killed, but you never see a SWAT truck at Ultra, yet it was engaged right. on the beach. And so nothing was occurring at that time that necessitated a SWAT truck, right? And my, they, came, they came out with the AR-15 walking around. They weren't there to extract anybody. And all of a sudden, the media rushed to them. The media wasn't recording uh, Officer Mitchell interacting with the revelers, and they're hugging him and thanking him for moving things around. No, the, tr the, the, the media went right to that truck and basically set this statement that, oh, this truck has been there the whole day. It was there for an incident when actually it just showed up the last 35 minutes. So the Goodwill Ambassadors and Officer Miami Beach PD went to do a great job that whole day, calming everything's down. And it, it made them feel like they wasted all that time and energy because at the last minute, the SWAT truck showed up unannounced without them even knowing and changed the whole situation. Yeah. All right, uh, Stephen. So when, when you bring out an AR-15, I mean, I'm a gun guy, right? I have a concealed weapon permit. I'm a gun guy. I get it, right? But when you bring out an AR-15, that shows deadly force. Deadly force? For what? And For torture? I mean, it doesn't match up. We, we do not condone the activities, but all those activities are capital crime. Understood. You, so, so you're talking about the atmosphere that was wrong from the get-go. Fair point. Hold on. We've got a break we got to do, and we'll be back in two minutes to pick this up right where we left off. We are glad you were with us this morning. We are talking to Stephen Johnson, chair of the Miami-Dade Black Affairs Advisory Board, and Glendon Hall, who is um, the chair of the Miami Beach Black Advisory Board. Uh, Stephen Johnson, let me ask your opinion, get both of your opinions on this. We are told that the city of Miami Beach initially had set aside a million dollars to provide uh, money for events, for things for the spring breakers to do while they were here. And then they said, no, it's the era of COVID-19. We, we can't have events where people who won't be, wear, won't be wearing masks are coming together like this. So they didn't spend the money. Uh, Stephen, was that a mistake? Should they have had planned events that would have given these kids something to do other than drink a lot and hang out on Ocean Drive? It absolutely was a mistake, and I'll tell you why. If you wanted the kids to wear masks, you could have had an event and told them, put your masks on. If you wanted to control your crowds, because your hotels were at 100% occupancy, but your bars and restaurants were only at 50% occupancy, you have to give these crowds something to do. Left to their own devices, you end up with additional chaos. And I know that frustrates the people who live on Miami Beach, but what I don't like is that when it comes to black events, this is always the case. Let's just throw extra money at policing. But if it's another event, if it's a food and wine festival, oh, let's throw plenty of money at that. that well, let me, Stephen, let me just, I've heard this, I've heard you say this before. There, there is a component of apples and oranges there because there are sanctioned events on the beach all over Dade County. Food and Wine mm -hmm. is one of them. Art Basel, you know, you've mentioned. There's, there's the Jazz in the Garden in Miami Gardens, which actually our station has sponsored in the past. Uh, and that is a predominantly black city and a predominantly black event. All, all of these events are sort of corporate sponsored or corporate owned and they're contractual and they come in and they have to go by rules and security. And it's kind of a different thing, event, even though it's the same word, as a spring break, whether it's here or South Padre Island in Texas or wherever, where it's just a place where people come. And but Glenn, that yeah. act 
if you consider that Jazz in the Gardens is owned by the city of Miami Gardens. They created that event. If you know that you're going to have uh, thousands and thousands of visitors coming to your city and you want to be able to direct and disperse and control the crowd, you can do things. And we've been saying it for over 10 years. You can do things and have things to make people see other parts of your city. As Glendon has said in other times, you've got Mid Beach, you've got North Beach. There are other parts of the beach for people to explore so that they're not all compressed on South Beach. But it's not necessarily fair to compare Jazz in the Gardens to Miami Beach because sometimes black folks like everyone else just want to go to the beach. No, of course, and that wasn't a comparison at all of cities. It was comparison of events. And Glendon, is that doable? Do you think the city of Miami Beach would go out and get corporate sponsors and, and be in charge like Miami Garden so successfully has of putting something like that on the beach? Well, definitely. I mean, there was a time where the city of Miami Beach had a program called Respect the Scene. It was started like back in 2012, where they had, you know, Hedonis Haslam, Dwayne Wade, and other celebrities um, who had, uh, you know, marketing pitches, PSAs, even had cutouts on the beach that basically said, look, we welcome you here. We want you here but just respect the scene, party responsibly. I mean, they did a lot of work on that and did a lot of uh, you know, networking with, with the hotels and, and media, social media and everything else to get the word out there. So it created the atmosphere that, look, we do want you here. You're welcome, but let's do the right thing. And also too, as I mentioned before, I mean, that it all encompasses the, even the goodwill ambassadors that are there. They don't get highlighted enough. These people work a tremendous amount of time and hours to actually keep the beach safe not only for the residents, but also for the tourists, you know, passing out masks, you know, assisting them with, you know, with good bags and, and, and assisting them with, you know, directions and everything else. And a lot of people don't see that. The media was there not to see that. They don't see the goodwill that's happening and the, the great interactions. In my opinion, they were only there to see something pop off, and that's what they got. So I I want, and maybe after the program, we can have a conversation, because that's the second time you talked about the media. We, the news media, report news. You know, what is great and supposed to happen, technically, by definition, is not news. So that's a whole conversation we can have also. But you had a question. Go I could just say what I saw. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me ask you both. Uh, you're quite aware, 20, 25 years ago, the city of Fort Lauderdale had a problem with out of control crowds. Those were almost exclusively white college kids who came down. They had seen where the boys are. They wanted, you know, to hang out. And uh, the city of Fort Lauderdale went into a huge program to discourage kids from coming down and misbehaving. And it's largely been successful. So what can the city of Miami Beach do to send out a message that it just, it's glad to have peaceful visitors come, enjoy themselves, enjoy the city, uh, but not misbehave. What, Glendon, what should the city do? Well, the thing about it is, the success, I used to be involved with Fort Lauderdale. I mean, I was part of that. Back then you had, you know, art stocks, playpen, pin rods. I mean, it was crazy. I mean, you had wet t-shirt contests. Peep, those those hotels wouldn't, wouldn't even maintain them because they knew that the place would get torn up. I mean, it was crazy. But what happened is the city start investing on A1A. They put in a whole new uh, infrastructure, road improvements, um, the whole wave um, wall. And they, they actually changed the zoning and got some of those really bad, you know, restaurants and bad um, establishments out and, and really changed the, the type of, of businesses there. They got in uh, companies, uh, chain put in office space, everything else. So they yeah. actively changed the flavor. But it all, took all right. So, so let me just jump in and say, then what should Miami Beach do? Should it uh, uh, really get more strictly into code enforcement? The restaurants on Ocean Drive or on Washington Avenue are, I mean, they're not lax there. They go in and enforce code uh, regulations. Michael, if I may, this conversation has, has evolved. To into more of a art deco, a cultural district and getting rid of, you know, stores like you know tattoo shops and and the like and head shops i mean things like getting rid of these golf carts and these uh yeah. um zip cars and everything that zip around and making all this noise and the scooters 
I mean, those don't add to the ambience. It, it just adds to the chaos. So they should be rezoning to get different businesses in there and actually focus on galleries, art, culture, rather than this back and out, um, atmosphere. But the city needs to get involved with that and do it on, a, on an investment that they know it's not going to just take one year. It's going to take multiple years. Yeah. And it takes um, no, that, it's that a long, Yeah, it's a long-term process. Stephen, yes. you wanted to jump in and make a comment. Go ahead. I'm going to say, to the extent that we're talking about the black tourist and the black traveler, I don't want the city of Miami Beach should do anything to, quote-unquote, discourage. And I think we need to get away from that discourage. If you want to encourage people to come, you curate a scene that they'll want to be a part of. And to me, it's very important that we include the black traveler from around the country and the world in that conversation. So anything that the city of Miami Beach does, they should prepare in advance for the crowds they're going to get. And I don't think that was the case here. And they should consider what words they're using and what language they're using and how it's going to be interpreted. Because this particular curfew was literally the shot heard around the world. And everyone remembers the first boycott. I don't want to see that occur again but we may find ourselves there. Mm. That was, uh, you know, perception is reality. Such a great point. Sit tight, we got a little break to do and we'll be right back. We are back talking about spring break on the beach with Stephen Johnson from Miami-Dade's Black Affairs Advisory Board, Glendon Hall from Miami Beach's newly formed Black Advisory Committee. Stephen, great point right before the break. Perception is reality to so many people. And I think the message that we are all sort of watching unfold is what, how people perceive how they are being treated. Uh, it seems like everybody's a little bit right and a, a, everyone's a little bit wrong, but I just want to talk about the geography for a minute. Um, Miami Beach, as you somebody mentioned before, is a pretty long place. I think it's like seven or nine miles. What we're talking about is a matter of blocks where all of this is going down, super concentrated, super crowded. The steps that the Miami Beach Police Department have taken where crowds are concerned, uh, the causeways, diverting causeways one way, sometimes closing them, that that is not unprecedented. This has been done before, and and I want to sort of Stephen hear you talk about what kind of extreme emergency crowd control would you find acceptable from Beach Police Department to control crowds, no matter when, no matter the emergency. So there were a couple things that have been mentioned before that I think were great ideas. For instance, if you wanted to control or were concerned about the transporting of, of weapons onto the beach, shut down your parking lots. And the city owns a lot of them and they have a lot of spaces. You can do that quite easily. And what that does is that makes a traveler take an Uber or um, come from their hotel. But more than likely under those circumstances, anyone who flew in didn't bring a pistol, right? So the <laughs> weapons that you're finding connected to cars. You can control the cars. I don't have a problem with controlling the flow of traffic in order to keep things tamped down. There were a lot of people coming from the mainland and coming from West Palm that might not have had some of the same intentions as the travelers. There were things they could do without shutting down the entire causeway and inconveniencing not only those travelers, but also their own residents. That was amazing to me, to, to put the residents through that. Um, again, with four hours notice, God forbid you had a dinner party to go to last Saturday, you, you, you had a problem. Um, we, we have to do better. And I'd also add, there was no crime that was committed that was outlandish. When I say outlandish, I mean, they dealt with 400 arrests during a Memorial Day. Yeah. Uh, well, Stephen, uh, if, I can, if I can jump in, forgive me, you're the uh, excellent lawyer. I'm just a reporter. I mean, there was <laughs> one outrageous crime, and I know you both would agree that the, the death of Christine Engelhart, 24-year-old woman who was on the beach you know, by herself, went back to her hotel with two guys. Uh, they gave her some kind of a green pill. Uh, they had sex with her, maybe against her will, and then she later died. I mean, that is just a tragic event. And but that crime has nothing. To do, that I'm crime sorry. has nothing to do with 
do with the black tourist. And that crime is not a crime that has not unfortunately occurred on Miami Beach before. And we should not sit here and act as though we initiated this curfew to save that young woman because we didn't. One thing has nothing to do with another, and it was a terrible crime. And like any other uh, crime, I want it investigated, I want it prosecuted, I want all of those things, like everyone else does. Glenn, but that has nothing to do with, 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 with the black tourists coming to Miami Beach, yeah, well, and that except, has nothing... Except to say that the two young men who are now accused of this heinous crime were both here, I believe from North Carolina, on spring break. Uh, and Did, did and so the it, mass shoot, the mass shooting in Colorado didn't have anything to do with those people who were born in Syria. That crime didn't have anything to do with anybody who happens to be black. That crime had to do with that woman and those individuals. And let's not confuse or conflate blackness with a crime. All right, uh, you know, it's a, they, Stephen, it's a, an right. excellent point. Right. Uh, Lyndon Hall, you are heading this new committee. Uh, what are you going to do with the information? You've been out on the street. I'm sure other members have been out there. Are you going to go to the city uh, commission and mayor and make a report? And what do you think you're gonna say to them? Well, we have recommendations. We have a meeting um, occurring actually on Tuesday. And I wanna make a quick comment about um, Christine, I went to her vigil, and we, as I mentioned, and even Steve concurs, you know, we, we don't condone any of that, right? Um, and we, we share the pain of the family, but we cannot put a brush of all the people. I mean, most of the people who came down for this event, so when I met with this time, were peaceful. We only have a small oh. amount that was the problem, but yet they get the focus, unfortunately, and that's, that's sad to see. So. Moving forward, we have a lot of different recommendations that have been provided to the uh, to commission. I mean, we have um, the American Black Film Festival, the Soul Vegan Fest that happens in North Beach, bringing Gumbe back possibly, but to the point where we made earlier, we can't just have it just concentrated in South Beach. We need to spread this these activities around. These are good, family-friendly, cultural art events, but have them in Mid Beach, have them in North Beach, and in, if you have something even much larger, maybe we can partner with the county to maybe even have some things over at Hallover to distribute some of that 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 emphasis of, of activities, but spread it around so it's not just concentrated on 10 blocks. People thinking all over the world that Miami Beach has fallen off the cliff. But actually, the rest of the city is functioning correctly, but just these 10 blocks are having all the issues. So Glendon Hall, Stephen Johnson, and your daughters in the background, who it's always great to hear from them. Um, great to speak with you both. And I, I feel like as someone who likes to spread the love, I feel like when we keep talking about this, we can all like find the solution. So let's all keep talking about that. Great to have you with us. Thanks so much. Thanks, gentlemen. Really appreciate Thanks. it. All right, next, protecting peaceful protest or chilling free speech. The Florida House this week passed the so-called anti-riot bill championed by Governor DeSantis. The state Senate may not go along with that, and we've got lawmakers from both bodies with us live next. The Florida State House passed on Friday one of this session's most controversial bills that would, among other components, amp up enforcement and penalties to violence and vandalism specifically during protests. This bill was one of Governor DeSantis' top priorities for the session, and it passed along party lines. Now it's going to head over to the state Senate, where its future is uncertain. This morning, we have two of the leading voices in the debate over HB1. As it is known, State Senator Jason Pizzo is a Democrat from Northeast Miami-Dade. He is the chair of the Senate Criminal Justice Committee, where the bill has been bottled up. State Representative Juan Fernandez Barquin is a Republican who represents a portion of Southwest Miami-Dade. He has been one of the bill's prime sponsors in the House, and he delivered closing arguments for it on Friday. Gentlemen, welcome. Good to see you. Hello. Good Hi, good morning. Great. Representative uh, Fernandez Barquin, let me begin with you. Since you spoke out for the bill, I watched your remarks on the Florida Channel on Friday. Uh, I guess the point would be Florida already has many laws on the book that make rioting illegal and allow police to crack down 
on anybody who takes part in a riot, who would uh, harm someone else, who would destroy property. So why does the Combating Public uh, Disorder Act, why is it needed? Good morning, Michael. Thank you. Uh, you know, that's a fantastic question, and many, many other representative at representatives asked me that same question. And the bottom line is that if we look at the definition of riot currently as it stands in law, which was determined by a state Supreme Court case in 1975, and it's a 45-year-old definition, the definition itself is outdated. Uh, if you take a look at it, it, it mentions things like tumultuous disturbance, terror of the people, unlawful enterprise. I mean, what we've done with this bill is improve upon the definition in order to protect our residents, protect businesses, protect property, protect law enforcement, and most of all, protect peaceful protesters so that law enforcement can distinguish, and they're not using this vague, ambiguous language so they can distinguish between what's a peaceful protester and what's a rioter. So Jason Pizzo, let's join the yes. conversation here. Michael had mentioned that this is sort of bottled up in the Senate and the reason it's bottled is because of you. You chair the <laughs> Criminal Justice Committee and it's not even on your agenda this week. So take a crack at the uh, the con on this. Uh, there are several cons in, in, in many of the sections. There's one redeemable section as it relates to doxing and giving out people's personal information for harassment, but the bulk of the bill is is really Candidly, nothing more than a bullet point for a mailer for the governor, either for re-election or for something else. You know, when farmers need something uh, as it relates to agriculture, they reach out to the legislatures and and, and draft something. When when CPAs or insurance companies need something, or you know, our constituents are suffering, they reach out and we we draft accordingly. We're doing that with unemployment. We're going to do that uh, with a number with insurance as well. Businesses ask for COVID liability. No law enforcement officer ever called Representative Fernandez Barkeen or me. Uh, during any part of last year asking for this. This was simply a proposal and an announcement, uh, whimsical at best, by the governor, and it's unnecessary. We, we've had protests in this country uh, for a very long time and for very good reasons, uh, none of which uh, really interfere with the, the livelihood or the, uh, the daily actions of Representative Barkeen or myself. So as long as you're mentioning the curtain, Re Representative Barkeen, so take us through the behind the scenes. Who, how, you are the sponsor of this bill. Did you come up with this one morning? Did someone ask you to do this? How, how did this bill bubble up into your consciousness? Oh, Glenda, I knew that question was coming. Uh, so, I mean, as, as we all know, the governor meant, made references to a bill after, after the, uh, the rioting uh, that occurred over the summer. And, and I, quite frankly, volunteered for it because I was touched by a very, a very sad situation uh, that occurred in my own district that if if you recall and I believe your channel covered it It's the uh, there was a statute of Jesus Christ. that was beheaded at uh, the Church of Good Shepherd And that's that's literally five blocks away from my house and that occurred in, in July of 2020 and there were there were strong suspicions that those uh, individuals who engaged in that nefarious activity uh, were were out uh, outlaws um, I'm sorry, uh, you know wrongdoers criminals um, and, and there was a whole string of other attacks throughout the county on, on religious institutions. And I felt that, uh, that those individuals deserve to be punished, punished just, as, just as much as, as the rioters. And there is a segment in my bill that, that deals with memorials and deals with historical property. So I called up the speaker's office and I, and I volunteered yeah. and I said, hey, listen, if something comes down the pipe, I, I want to be, be the guy carrying it because I want to protect my residents. I want to protect the private property or law enforcement, and, and I want to make sure that uh, that that criminals uh, get the punishment that yeah. they deserve. Representative Barkeen, I remember that really ugly incident, the vandalism where the head of Jesus was, in fact, uh, taken off the statue. But that was, as I recall, a deranged individual, somebody who was sick, uh, who was subsequently arrested. I mean, the real cause for HB1 were the Black Lives Matter protests that occurred in Miami, uh, Tampa, Jacksonville in late May and early June after the killing of George Floyd. I mean, that is the impetus. Is it not for the bill? Michael, I would say protests, no. Riots, yes. We cannot forget that Bayside was looted. It and was. there's several videos. There's several videos of it. We can't forget that there were four police cars burned in downtown Miami. Uh, we can't forget that there was a Champ Sports building that was burned down 
in Tampa. And there were several small businesses that were affected that put put these small businesses and families out of business. And, and we can't forget that this also occurred in Jacksonville. So I would say protests, no, riots, yes. The riots were the impetus for this. And it wasn't just here. I mean, clearly across the nation, there was over $2 billion worth of damages, uh, roughly over 2,000 police officers injured. Uh, and and, and so, so I would say the impetus was, was the violent acts. So the Jason, uh, Jason Pizzo, there already were laws against all of those things that were just mentioned. The, this mm -hmm. bill sort of amps up the penalties for those. But when it, when it went through the House in every committee and the floor vote, this was a party line vote. So as a Democratic senator, really what, what is wrong with enforcing and, and amping up penalties for this destructive and violent behavior. What, what's wrong with this bill on face value? Why wouldn't everyone embrace a, a crackdown on wrongdoing? It's a, a, a fair question. We will take an a la carte sort of approach, as we should, and a very deliberate one based on data. Now, the narrative, and, and I don't mean to draw it so partisan, unfortunately, it is, but the, the data is very important because the narrative on the other side, so to speak, is about how people are being arrested and then they're let, they're let out and they're right back into the into the fray and they're being rearrested again. That's crap. 298 people were arrested in Tampa on May 30th into the morning of the 31st, another 68 on June 2nd, uh, 13 in Tallahassee, uh, a, a bunch in Jacksonville and some in Miami. Nobody was rearrested. But that's been the narrative you know, for several months now from the other side of the aisle. The irony here is, and I even commented to the representative yesterday, he used to be a public defender. I was the prosecutor. So, I mean, you know, the kids that are watching today with, with, with grandma and grandpa, I mean, that, that's the ultimate irony. There's several sections of this bill that are just wrong. If a kid gets in a college gets in a shoving match, shoving match, he's doing six months in jail. Yeah. Senator, let me ask you, in fact, I know you are a former assistant state attorney in Miami-Dade. You know, there is a provision in this bill that says that anybody who was arrested as a rioter uh, would have to remain in jail until their initial court appearance. That seems to be a denial of due process, doesn't it? Well, we do have we do have that provision. You know, there's a whole list of criteria on on, on safety for for society, securing a presence, a continuing threat. We have that for murderers and rapists. Uh, and domestic violence situations where there should be a, a cooling off period. The fastest process time in and out of TGK in Miami Dade, as I'm sure you guys know, is at best five hours. So it, it's 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 a false narrative. We have kids that will basically, and I say kids because of folks. I mean, this is, these are these are kids expressing themselves, you know, very often. And it, to Representative Barkeen's point about we need these laws, we need these laws. This is not a new phenomenon. If, we, if this was mid-1868 and we were drafting the new version of the Florida Constitution, I would understand. But we've had protests. We've had things that escalated into riots and looting. And we have laws on the books for those. The, the legislature has found them to be appropriate for years. I Senator, was Senator, I, I just want to, I'm, I hate to interrupt. We go through this every week. Interrupting on Skype for a very good reason. we got to take a break. Um, but we will pick this right up when we come back. Thank you. We are talking on This Week in South Florida with State Senator Jason Pizzo from Northeast Miami-Dade, State Representative uh, Juan Alfonso Fernandez Barquin from Southwest Miami-Dade. Representative Barquin, let me ask you, you're clearly aware, you're a lawyer, well-educated. Uh, protesting, demonstrating in this country is as American as apple pie. I mean, we had the Boston Tea Party. Uh, in the 60s, there were marches for civil rights, for uh, public accommodation. I remember because I was a kid, I marched in some of those. Uh, and they changed uh, laws, they changed uh, inequities, they, you know, made progress. Uh, so what is it about, is there something about demonstrating, protesting that you find objectionable? Michael. Protests are fine, and protests are, are completely legal. The issue here is when, when the protests turn violent, and th they start damaging businesses, they start damaging private property, they start uh, injuring innocent individuals. I mean, protests are absolutely fine. And, and you know, and, and, and something that I found during the debate 
uh, yes, yesterday, uh, I'm sorry, on Friday, and, and in a lot of the questions I got on, on Thursday on my bill, is that th there seems to be across the aisle uh, it's this obfuscation where they're interchangeably using protesters and rioters. Protesters and rioters are two completely different individuals. The protesters are there for a cause, to try and get a message across. And the rioters are there to, to, that are trying to get trying to get a free flat screen TV from, or, or trying to get some, uh, some shoes from the Foot Locker. That's a, okay, they're, Representative, they're the that's, a, that's a very fair point in that distinction. Um, Senator Pizzo, in the short time we have left, I want to sort of take a look at another component to the bill that I think, I don't know what words Linda. in your mouth, but I, I just want to, there, the efforts to what this bill is calling defund the police, reallocate uh, sure. a, a local decision to reallocate police resources would be cir uh, possibly circumvented by the state. Those decisions locally now taken away. That is part of this bill. Address that if you would. I will quickly. It's a very, very important issue. Glenna, nobody in my district wants to defund the police. Nobody in my district wants fewer police officers on the street. Nobody. False narrative, very effective in a campaign, not reality. Nobody in my district wants to defund the police. The problem is, is that if anybody's cutting back across the board ecumenically on a budget, parks and recreation, you know, little league teams and things like that, Everybody's cutting back. The, own, the governor himself has asked each and every single one of his agency heads to look at three to six percent reductions in cutbacks. That was the basis of why I was upset and rather disturbed a meeting last week in criminal justice appropriations because there was a hundred and forty million dollar cut to the Department of Corrections, eleven point eight million dollar cut to the state attorney's office, and over three million dollar cut to public defenders. I was incensed by it. I think it's I think it's unrealistic. But how can you say that the statewide agencies are going to have a cutback? But there might not be a cutback. You don't think the commercial revenue and the tax basis for places like Miami Beach that didn't have any spring break revenue last year or a number of my commercial businesses are, are going to have to be paying less in property taxes, which is less revenue for cities and counties, which means they may have to cut back uh, and, and tighten the belt a little bit. It's hypocritical. It's, yeah, it's, you know, yeah. Senator Senator Pizzo and Representative Barkin, we are just about out of time. Just in 10 seconds or so, Senator Pizzo, are you going to let this uh, bill uh, HP1, the Senate version, get out of your committee? It'll never be heard in my committee, but they'll do an end run around me. And it'll go to another one. It'll, they'll take the House bill. It'll probably go to rules in the Senate. It'll be heard once. It'll go to the floor. But, I mean, you know, for Representative Barkeen's got to wear Grandma's ugly Christmas sweater for a while. <laughs> I feel like we should let you have the last word on Barkeen, but we're out of time. Well, just really quick, I just want to say that violence discredits the cause of the protest. And that's the bottom line here. Fair point. And we right. forget that. Fair point. Appreciate we you we both. got it. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And come Listen. back Thank soon. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. We'll be right Thank back. You. That is our program for today. Thank you so much for weighing in. I'm watching email and Twitter, and a lot of people have a lot to say on what we discussed today. Love that. Keep those coming. And thank you for being here with us. As they used to say, we're in touch, so you be in touch. Email Glenna, me, Twitter, whatever you want to do, we'll get back to you. And as always, remember, stay informed, get involved. Have a great Sunday.